A vector equation has the form x1 a1 through xn a n equals a vector b. A matrix equation of the same type, uh, it's just a different format, is ax equals b. An example is matrix a, let's look at a 2 by 4. That is given here. A lot of times a subscript will contain the dimensions of your matrix, two rows, four columns. Uh, matrix A, that's just a simple four by one, all one entries. And then B is a two by one, five, eight. Um, I do want to point out with matrices on multiplication, the columns of the first one have to match the number of rows of the second one. The result will be the size or dimensions of the outer numbers, two by one. But the insides have to match when you multiply. A transforms X into B. <coughs> Excuse me. And B is the image of that transform. Um, if we take a set of all the vectors from R4, specifically X, this one given in the problem, and we multiply by A, that transforms it onto R2, two entries. A transformation T from Rn to Rm is a rule that assigns to each vector X and Rn a vector Tx in Rm. This was our Rn. Tx was where B fell into that R2. The set Rn is called the domain of T, and Rm, which is the right set, is called the codomain of T. Now, we're used to hearing domain and range. That's not going away, but for these, it's domain transformed into range. The notation T is colon Rn arrow Rm indicates the domain of T is Rn, so your domain's still going to be first, Codomain will be on the right. For all X and R in, once you transform into R M, the vector T X is called the image of X. The set of all images of T X is called the range of T. So here's a visual. If we take a vector out of Rn, linear transformation going through T, wherever that new vector after you multiply T and X, wherever that's located, that's, that image falls on the range. The range may or may not fully cover the codomain, so that's why I have this it's sort of like a partition in a box. The range is where all of the images fall, and that may or may not take up all the codomain. An example, let's take matrix A. It's a three by two. Vector U is a two by one. Vector B is a three by one. And C is two. We're going to define T as the linear transformation from R2 to R3. And we're going to do that by defining that transformation as matrix A times whatever vector we put in for X. If we do TX, which is equal to AX by definition, then we take matrix A, multiply it by vector X, which is R2, it only has two entries, then that's going to give us a three entry image. And if we carry out the multiplication, 1x1 minus 3x2, 3x1 plus 5x2, negative x1 plus 7x2. Okay, so this problem we're going to look at four different um, parts to it. Sorry, I'm having trouble talking today. 
Um, let's find TU, which is the image of you under the transformation T. So that's going to be, if you look at the top of the page, suppose I'd called that U after we apply the transformation, we're looking for the vector that falls on this partition. Okay, so if we take matrix A and multiply it by U, A will transform this vector in R2 into a vector in R3. And if you carry out the multiplication, that matrix times this one, we have 2 plus 3, which is 5, 6 minus 5, that's 1, and negative 2 minus 7, that's negative 9. This is the image. Part B, solve T of X equals B, and again, as a reminder, TX is defined as AX, matrix A times vector X. All right, so from the previous slide, we have matrix A, vector X, which is an R2, and we're gonna go for R3 as our codomain. Let's build and reduce an augmented matrix. I'm gonna take the columns of A, the column of B, row reduced echelon form, x2 is equal to negative half, x1 is equal to three halves, so I've made a note here, x1 is three halves, x2 is negative one half, therefore vector x, the one we were looking for, is equal to the vector three halves negative one half. The image of x under t, if we were to take this vector, transform it using matrix A, then vector 3, 2, negative 5 is the image. Part C, is there more than one X whose image under T is B? Uh, the answer to that is no. If we go back to part B at the top, we had a unique solution. Pivots in each column, those are equal to exactly that two entry vector. If you have exactly or a unique solution, consistent and unique, then there's exactly one X whose image is B. Determine if matrix C is in the range of T. That is, is AX equal to C consistent? Okay, so we're gonna take the two columns from matrix A, insert matrix C, and that's from the previous slide, Row reduce. Um, remember, A only had those two first two columns. Now there's pivots there, but the problem is if you have a row, in order to be consistent, this would have to be non zero if that's non zero. But if everything is zero until the end, that's inconsistent because you don't have any variables but you're trying to say that zero is equal to one, and we can't have that. Uh, because the system is inconsistent, or um, C is not in the range of T. Okay, so let's check out a geometric reinforcement. Uh, let's take matrix A. Very simple, we're gonna define the transformation of X as the multiplication of X by this matrix A. Uh, matrix A projects points in R3 onto the XY plane. Why is that? If we take a three entry vector X and we multiply it by matrix A, that bottom row of zeros cancels out any X3 entry, leaving only X1 and X2 to have any kind of variation. So it takes the th that third dimension out of it and keeps you with only two entries. 
Number two, let A be defined as one, two, zero, one. And the transformation T, we're gonna define that as R2 to R2. Defining the transformation by the matrix of any vector by matrix A. This one in particular is called a shear transformation. Let's take a square, origin, vector u, which I just called it 2, 0. If we go out 2 and don't go up or down, that's vector u. Vector v is 0, 2, so we don't go left or right. We just go up 2. And then finally, w is out here. So it forces us to have a two by two square. Now, if we multiply all three of these vectors by matrix A, then each one gets transformed into a new location. Zero, if you take matrix A times zero, it's still gonna be zero. So that point's fixed, and that's this point, or vertex, however you wanna think of it. Uh, matrix, excuse me, vector u, which was 2, 0, if we transform u, it doesn't move either. It comes right back out to 2, 0. So u and tu are at the same location. v, which is defined as 0, 2, when multiplied by matrix A, you get the result or image for 2. So V gets transformed onto a new location. Its image lands here. <coughs> Excuse me. And then finally, W, which was 2, 2. If you transform vector W, take matrix A times W, you get the image 6, 2. Now, that square has been sheared over. And so this transformation in, in particular transforms a square into a par parallelogram. A transformation or mapping T is linear if the transform of the sum of two vectors is the same as a transformation of each vector then added for all U and V in the domain of T. There's also scalar multiplication that gets preserved. The transformation of a scaled vector is the scale of that transformation. Linear transformations preserve the operations of vector addition and scalar multiplication. If T is a linear transformation, then transforming a zero vector will also give you an image of a zero vector. And addition of scaled vectors transformed, that can also be broken up using these top two properties. Example, given a scalar R, define the linear transformation of R2 into R2 by Tx equals Rx. So we're going to take a scalar or a constant and multiply it by, into vector x. T is called a contraction if you're multiplying by a number between 0 and 1, and a dilation if r is a scalar greater than 1. Let's let r be 3. U be the vector 2, 1, and V be the vector negative 3, 1. Each of these vectors has how many entries? Two of them. Very good. Transforming vector U just requires us to multiply it by 3. 3 times 2, 3 times 1, that gives us the image 6, 3. Vector V transformed, again, the transformation is just multiplying by a scalar, is 3 times vector v, negative 9, 3. That's the image. Now, let's look at that first property at the very top. If we were to add vectors u and v, 2 plus negative 3, that's negative 1, 
1 plus 1 is 2. Transforming that, again, the sum, we got negative 1 and 2. Now, when we transform it, that means multiplying it by 3 or whatever scalar is given in your problem. And that gives us negative 3, 6. If we were to add the transformations up, instead of transforming each one separately and then adding, if we just add the transformations, 6 plus negative 9, that's also negative 3. It's the same vector. And 1 plus 1 is 2 times 3 is 6. So whether you do these separately and then add, transform and then add, or if you add your vectors and then transform, they come out to the same, and that's a, a nice property of a linear transformation. T is a linear transformation. Here's the visual to that. If we were to draw out vectors u, v, and the sum, the transformation of u is just tripling that vector's length. v, triple its length. u plus v, which you would get that from the parallelogram rule, tripling its length would give you the transformation of u plus v. So it all fits pretty nicely. And it's kind of intuitive if... Um, You draw it out. You don't have to draw these out, but if you do, it'll help give you a visual if you happen to be a visual learner. Define a linear transformation from R2 to R2 by Tx being this matrix times vector x. 0 times x1 minus 1 times x2 gives us negative x2. 1 times x1 plus 0 x2, that gives us x1. So basically this transformation takes x and it flips it and negates each entry. Find the images of t under u and v where u is defined as 4, 1, v is defined as 2, 3. If you go ahead and add these, you get 6 and 4. The transformation of u, if you take 4, 1, and in your mind just flip those and change each one sign, then you get a negative 1 and a positive 4. Vector v, flip and negate the top one, then you'll get a negative 3 and the 2. Okay, so that's your image. The vector gets flipped and x2 gets negated. The sum up here is 6, 4. If you flip and negate the top, that makes it a negative 4 and a 6. And this is what that transformation looks like geometrically. u plus v, if you were to transform, and we did that up here, all that work up here was transforming u, v, the sum, but what you end up getting is a transformation that's counterclockwise about the origin 90 degrees. U gets mapped to here, V gets mapped to here, and U plus V gets mapped to there. And let's do one example extra. Find all vector X, excuse me, find all X and R4 that are mapped into the zero vector by the transformation x mapped by a times x. Matrix A, we have a 3 by 4 matrix. Um, now remember, 3 by 4 would require x to be a 4 by 1 because the inner numbers have to match. So we're going to set that up. We're going to introduce a 0 column over here to solve this homogeneous equation, matrix equation. So these first four columns are matrix A, and then we put a last column of zeros in, again, because we're solving a homogeneous augmented matrix. Row reduce gives us a full row of zeros, so that tells us consistent, but these are free. All right, so remember, column one, it's x1, x2, x3, x4. 
In fact, let me sketch that up here. X1 dot 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 X4 R4 so X would have to have four entries. Uh, what that tells us though is X3 and X4 are both free and I made a note over here. X2 is equal to positive 3X3 minus 4x4 x1 is equal to positive 8x3 minus 7 once you transfer those over x4 so again here's x1 after the free variables are moved over and here's x2 x3 and 4 are still free so when we set up matrix a excuse me matrix X, X1 is 8X cubed minus, excuse me, 8X3 minus 7X4, X2 is 3X3 minus 4X4, X3 and X4 are free. Now, take out the X3s, and that will leave you with 8, 3, 1, and 0, Take out all the x4s, and that will leave you with negative 7, negative 4, 0, and 1. x3 and x4 are free weights. These two vectors, if you want to call them u and v, the solution set is the span of those two vectors.